section forty two of g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen twenty one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen twenty one by g k chesterton at the sign of the world's end the ugliness of utopia it is a pity that the people who are trying to attack the worst sort of bolshevism have got hold of the very worst way of doing it i have been called a reactionary and in one sense i am a reactionary but i am quite sure there is one golden rule for all good little reactionaries to learn it is no good to give a superficial answer to a fundamental suggestion even if it is fundamentally false indeed if it is fundamentally false it is all the more necessary to answer it with what is fundamentally true there is no answer to anything radical even radically wrong except being more radical still if the other man has dug deep enough to have almost torn the plant up by its roots we must dig deeper and see that it brings its own soil with it so that it can live if the enemy is mining we must be countermining and the countermining must be undermining if the wrong sort of revolutionist is indeed undermining society he will most certainly blow up society unless we can undermine him the revolutionist will win unless we can be more revolutionary than he in the fundamental sense of being at once more skeptical and more visionary now our real hold on the skeptic is almost always in this that there is something which he does not doubt and we do challenged upon his own first principles he finds the whole of his movement checked thus for instance as long as we tell the bolshevist that his ideal is a beautiful and bewitching illusion he will lead men to worse fates in the future if they follow it now he will not altogether unnaturally say that it seems odd to refuse to follow an ideal because it is beautiful and that even by our own account there is as yet nothing to show that it is deceptive but if we tell him at the beginning that we think his ideal is ugly that it is ugly as an ideal and not merely as a reality and that as it is ugly in itself we are naturally not going to be bothered to follow it if we tell him that he is brought to a much more serious standstill in order to convert us at any rate he has to show that his ideal is not ugly but beautiful and worth following now the modern materialist will find it much more difficult to charm like a poet than to plan plausibly like a company promoter he will be less insinuating when he woos like a lover than when he takes chances like a tipster it is not really so difficult for him to convince people that his idea is attainable that he has figured it all out like a man with a financial tip or a system for monte carlo but we by hypothesis are not telling him that his idea is unattainable we are telling him we do not want to attain it whether it is attainable or not what he has to create in us is a motive that is a thing that makes other things move and it is not an easy business to create a motive not half so easy as to assume a motive and explain a plan what he has to do if he can is what the great prophets and religious founders did he has to make a sort of music in the air to which things stir and march even when they have seemed stiff as hedges or rooted as trees and the modern economic materialist is no orpheus in short it is easier to refute bolshevism as an ideal than bolshevism as a business proposition and this for a very vital and interesting reason that business can be mystifying whereas idealism must be plain anyone can see this by imagining any working example suppose a man knocks at the door with a proposition for providing everybody with a pair of stilts so that they can henceforth all walk about undefiled by mud and breathing a purer air on a level with the tops of trees it would take a long time to prove to him that he cannot provide everybody with stilts you might spend many happy hours with him in your library looking up encyclopedias and covering papers with calculations before you had proved to him from the census or the reports of the timber trade 
or the blue books on afforestation that the thing was impossible perhaps it isn't impossible an idea to be kept in mind about the other ideal also if you want to get rid of the gentleman selling stilts at the door it is much quicker to tell him that you don't want any stilts that you don't like stilts and that he has aroused no stilt motive like music in your mind or in short that walking on stilts forms no part of your ideal in short the idealistic answer is short sharp and practical whereas the practical answer is long-winded elaborate and tiresome if a man proposes to take you to johannesburg on one of those new amphibio automatic oil bicycles which are for all i know among the brightest and briskest business propositions advertised in that brilliant seat of culture it will take a long time to disprove to the tout that the bicycle can travel over land and sea it will need very complicated scientific calculation to demonstrate that the design is a swindle though since it emanates from the high places of imperial and scientific finance it very probably is it is much simpler to tell him the truth that burns immortally in the breast of every plain two-hearted englishman it is better to tell him that you do not want to go to johannesburg any more than to hell that is what i have to say to the bolshevist about the bolshevist utopia but the point here is that it would take a long time to go into the merits and demerits of the bicycle whereas it takes a very short time indeed to dismiss the merits and demerits of the south african city to get to the ideal is to get to the goal and be done with it to linger on the practical process may be interminable the idealistic method is businesslike the businesslike method is the devil of a business in the same way the really swift and simple modes of attack on marxian materialism and collectivism is simply pointing out that it is ugly not proving that it is unpractical it is in preventing people from desiring what the innovators think desirable much more than in merely prophesying whether they can get what they desire for a prophecy however practical is always arbitrary and mystical whereas a desire is a definite and objective fact like a dog or door knocker all men know what they want but only inspired seers know whether they can get it if men want property and liberty and the life of the distributive state as we maintain we will attempt to follow it up by proving it to be practical and probable but if men do not want collectivism and regimentation and compulsory labor and the rest of the bolshevist utopia then it will be a waste of our time to prove it impossible none of us will sit down to discuss the baffling difficulties of starting a pestilence or the little hitches and worries in the way of procuring a mad dog there is a truth probably unconscious in the common phrase that utopian revolutionists hope to make a new heaven and a new earth it is true that nobody makes a new earth without first making a new heaven and this is no more specially true when the heaven is full of gods and angels than when the heaven is empty of everything but ether and stardust it is quite as true when the heaven is only an abyss or bottomless pit of space it is quite as true when the heaven is rather like hell the higher thing towering over the earth and typifying the general nature of the universe is still the dominant condition and determining factor in all the earthly regulations and reforms the heaven of the atheist makes the earth of the atheist as much as the heaven of the saint makes the earth of the saint the basis of the whole marxian business is the religion of monism and materialism every man gets his economics from his religion only this religion is so laboriously topsy-turvy as to teach the opposite the notion that the religion came from the economics the answer to this is really quite simple the marxian socialist says that mental states come only from material conditions to which i reply that his material conditions are bad by his own account and therefore his mental conclusions are wrong by his own argument if the situation makes the soul and if it is a bad situation to be a proletarian then it is probably a worse situation to be a class-conscious proletarian if capitalism is a mood of material origin socialism is a mood of the very same material origin and that admittedly a very bad and misleading origin 
if economics produces ethics we have no more reason to trust the psychology of a proletarian brought up in a capitalist state than that of a capitalist brought up in a capitalist state the truth is that this is one intrinsically impossible and intolerable school of thought because it is thought against thinking the man who says that ideas are mere material results has in that very sentence destroyed all ideas including that one but there is an even deeper element among these elements of the case it is perhaps the element of emotion rather than thought why should a man want to maintain that his will is a blind plant of the swamp or that his ideals are idols made of mud why should men desire to entertain such a dogma as the materialist version of history i do not speak here of puzzle-headed skeptics who reluctantly digest such dogmas because they cannot reason their way out of them but of men who shout them like a war cry and intone them like a creed we can only say that there seems to be some such pessimistic perversity and spiritual suicide and that this sect must be counted among the strange sects so afflicted in practical fact i think they are often fighting against very real plutocratic tyranny but in truth there are two very different fights against tyranny there is the revolt against the tyrant by the slave and there is the revolt against the tyrant by the free man but nietzsche said of christianity what was emphatically not true of christianity actually is true of marxian materialism it is a slave morality a protest against particular authorities made by the spirit of slavery and not by the spirit of liberty for if it were really working from the love of freedom it would certainly begin with free will end of section forty two